Welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Nicolas Van de Put, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects ever, which is forecast value added. Um, today's webinar is a bit special because it's not just going to be about the theory, it's also going to be about discussing two case studies uh, from Sanofi and from Rich. And after that, we're going to really just show you in practice uh, what does this uh, look like. Um, just before we start, a quick word about myself and the team. So I am Nicolas Seth from Subchain. We are a consultancy company dedicated on uh, demand forecasting and inventory uh, optimization. I think the, the main point, and that's always the same, is that we really love what we do. We're really passionate about demand forecasting and inventory optimization. As you might know already, I published three books on the subject. I'm also publishing a lot of articles on my blog. If you want to learn more about uh, demand forecasting and inventory optimization, you can definitely check out the book, so just contact me. I am always very happy to discuss this subject. And if I just may summarize what we do in just a sentence, I just like to say that what we do is reducing forecast error and inventory. Now, this being said, I would like to introduce today's agenda. So I said, we're going to discuss forecast value added. I will introduce the topic to you, the concept in 20 minutes to try to first go from the theory. Then we will have two case study, first from Sanofi, then from Rich. And finally, we'll show you in a few minutes in practice, how does it work? What does it look like? The, the objective is really that you get the concept, the theory, you see how supply chain apply that, and then you see how it would work in practice. So it's crystal clear for you how you can use forecast value added and what you're going to get out of it. Um, let me start right away. So normally, if you have a demand planning, demand forecasting process, it should look like this. So the process should start with a forecast baseline. So you basically have a software or maybe it's just Excel, but you have a piece of software that's going to generate a forecast baseline for you. Starting from there, your demand planner are going to review that, enrich it, change a few things here and there. Then maybe the sales team is also going to look at it and do a few adjustments. And finally, you might have a consensus meeting who also gonna change the overall numbers. Okay, so basically we have a first step that generates an automated forecast. Maybe for some of you who are less mature in the process, that might just be a moving average in Excel, but you start from somewhere. Um, then you have different teams reviewing it and reaching it. And finally, it should be used by a supply chain. Um, so here as a joke on this slide, you see, I said that the supply chain is thinking, I need to disaggregate, de disaggregate this from monthly forecast to weekly forecast. That's not the topic of the uh, webinar today, but I think it's very important to keep in mind that when you have a demand planning process, it's extremely important that the forecast you generate has been done at the right granularity and horizon level that it can be used by supply chain. I see many, many companies uh, trying to make forecasts per month per market and then the supply chain people have to cut it down by week, by day, by warehouse. And basically, I think that most of the forecasts that are created are useless because they're going to be cut down later by supply chain. So there is kind of a mismatch between the demand planning process and how it's reused. Really That's not the subject for today, but it's still very important. What you can see on this slide is that people editing the forecast, some of them are kind of biased. So for example, here in my example, the sales team, actually what they really want is to secure inventory. So as they want to secure inventory, it's just going to raise, they're going to increase the total level of the forecast. So they're going to increase numbers. So they kind of make it safer for them and they know they're going to have enough inventory. But by doing that, they don't make it into a better forecast, don't improve forecasting accuracy. That's an issue. So if you are a demand planning manager and SNOP leader, you want to pay attention to two things. First, it's the concept of efficacy. You basically want to ensure that anyone touching the forecast is going to overall make it more accurate. You basically want people to improve the quality of your forecast. The other thing you want to do is to ensure that people don't overwork. People don't spend days or weeks reviewing a forecast to add little extra accuracy. So you need to balance the fact that People need to add value to your forecast, and at the same time, people should not overdo it and should not spend too much time on it. Now, basically, to solve that, we have one core concept called forecast value added. So here on the right side, you can see again the same process. 
So what we're going to do is that for each step in the process, we're going to try how much accuracy or how much forecast error they got. So in my example here, you see that we have first a forecast model that got a forecast error, an MAE of 45% and a bias of minus 3%. Then the demand planner are enriching the forecast and we kind of capture the enrichment they do and we're going to track again the forecast error as a forecast accuracy. In this case, you see that the baseline got an error of 45% and then the demand planners could get it down to 40, 43. So basically they added values and made your forecast better. That, that's just great. Now we also see in my example that the sales team is worsening the forecast. So before the sales team, the, the, the error, sorry, was at 43%. And after the, the addition of the sales team, it got to 45. So basically they made it worse. Remember, if I go back to my leader story, the sales teams, they don't really want to improve the forecast. They just want to secure inventory. And this is what we see in these numbers where they raise the total forecast. You see that they have a high positive bias and they worsen the forecasting um, error. So basically forecast value added, as we track the accuracy of every single team, we're gonna promote ownership. So because everyone, every team is gonna be responsible for the added values they have, for the enrichments they do. Okay, so people are gonna be the owner of their forecast and accountable for that. By doing that, we promote efficacy because we're gonna ensure that everyone is adding value. And we also promote efficiency because we don't just ask people, please work, please review forecast, please enrich forecast, just do that. Instead, we're asking people to make a better forecast, right? Not just to work and just to spend days editing the forecast. No, we're just asking, please, just do the few changes that you can kind of assure that you can uh, improve the forecast, okay? Now, we're going to discuss with the case studies, how do we implement that? What's very important here to keep in mind is that you could possibly, possibly try to do this in Excel, but it would take you days, if not weeks, and every month or every week, you would need to do that over and over again. That would nearly take a full-time job just to, to maintain that. So that's not the kind of thing you could do in Excel. You can just do it once to see how it works, but after you will need a piece of software to do that for you. The other thing that's important is to try to keep a single version per team or per even per person, so you're sure that everyone is accountable for what they do. Now, of course, Forecast value added somehow is limited because it's just a tool that's going to tell you which team or who is adding or removing value to your forecast, but this framework doesn't really tell you how can we improve the situation. So once you understand that there is a problem with a team that one team could just do better, we still have to discuss how can we discuss with the team, how can we improve their work. But that would be a story for another video. Today we just discussed the concept of forecast value added and how to track it. Um, another concept that's quite close to it and that's definitely related, that's also very important for me, it's the concept of forecast stability. Now, if I go back to this slide, you see that the first step in my process here is the forecasting model. Again, that could be for you a specific software you just implemented or that you could just be some Excel file, but still you start the process with this forecasting model. And in my example here, you've got this error of 45 now the question, and I think it's very important, is how do we know, how do you know if 45% is good enough or it's just not enough? Um, here's an example. On the right side, you see a forecast I made a few years ago for a client, and you can see here the demand pattern in my own forecast. And usually the question I ask during my training course to professional is, can you assess the quality of this specific forecast, okay? So people look at this and some are just saying, well, volatility is quite high, volatility is low, or your forecast seems to react to demand, so it seems good to me. But it's kind of very difficult if you imagine that you have 100,000 products to review to do this kind of analysis, skew by skew, model by model, to assess if it's a good or a bad uh, forecast. Instead, what I propose to do, which is actually very easy to do, is to compare this forecast to a benchmark. So I, the idea here is that we track the forecast error of the model and we track the forecast error of a simple moving average. You can see that on the slide, MA6 stands for moving average six months. So this model is just taking the average of the last six months and using this as a forecast. Now what we see on this very specific example is that the model I created does not add much value. If you compare the error of my model and a moving average, 
it's really unclear if this model adds any kind of value. Now, how can we use this with the forecast value added framework? Let me show you this in a second, and then I'll go back to this slide. What you can do as well here is to add a benchmark to the framework. So basically, instead of starting by a forecasting model with this 45%, you would start by a benchmark, like a moving average six months for 12 months. And by doing so, you can confirm that your software is adding value. And this is very important because I realize over time with all the companies I'm talking to that a lot of companies, a lot of software do not add any value compared to a benchmark. And this is, I think, a very difficult realization, but it's important to realize that some software do not add any value. Okay, so for me, forecast value added is not just about uh, assessing the added value of your team of people reviewing the forecast, but it's also about assessing the quality of the forecasting model um, itself. Another thing that's very important here to understand, especially for those of you who are uh, managers or SNOP leaders or directors in supply chain, um, I think as someone who's managing your team, you want to give target to your team. You want to give objectives. I've seen many supply chain giving objective in terms of absolute accuracy. So it would look like, well, next year we want to reach an accuracy of 60% or 80%, okay? And everyone should try to reach 80%. But as we can see here, for some, um, for some countries, for some market, or for some specific channels, it might be very difficult to reach that because these people start from a very low accuracy. So even though they will add value, they might never reach this kind of uh, absolute 80%. Instead, what I advise you on doing is to set added value target. So for example, you would say to your planning team, well, instead of as an objective having to reach 80% accuracy, you would say, well, everyone should try to add 5% of accuracy compared to the baseline model. Okay, so this reinforces the idea that for some team reaching 45% accuracy might be good enough, whereas for some other teams, they might need to reach 65% because they work in a very uh, stable environment. Okay. Um, I think I had something else to say on this slide, so I'm just back one slide. The great thing about forecast stability and comparing your model to a benchmark is that as soon as you do that, it gets kind of easy to assess how much accuracy you could aim for. What I've seen project after project is that for most cases, well, not 100% of the cases, but let's say 95% of supply chain, you can easily make models that beat benchmarks by 10, 20, or even 30%. So as soon as you start running a moving average on your data set and you realize the accuracy you can get using that, it's very easy for you to assess, well, how good could I possibly get for this specific type of market or channel? Because you just look at the error of your moving average and you can assume that you can reduce that by 10, 20, or even 30%. Um, again, one key message here is that comparing your software to a moving average might give you a lot of uh, insights about the quality of the software you are using right now. You might be surprised. I've been discussing with a lot of supply chain who got totally amazed by the result, or I would say the lack of results the software would get uh, compared to this moving average. Now, that's just twice the same slide, sorry for that. I have something else I would like to add here concerning forecast value added. Um, what I've seen is that for a lot of supply chain, you have product with very different value of cost. Like the example I always take is hammers versus nails. Maybe for your supply chain, you have some product that have very low value, very low cost, but you sell a lot of them. For example, these nails. And you have other products that, well, you sell some good numbers, but they worth a lot of money. Now, one of the issue of forecast value added or forecasting accuracy in general is that if I try to compare now hammers and nails and I want to compute the total number for this portfolio, I get an issue because nails, the number is so high that they're basically driving my total number. So basically here, if I am a demand planner, I would spend my time trying to review the nails because these are what I would call the main biggest offender on this data set. So as a planner, as someone in your team, you might want to spend time correct, like improving the nails, but not touching the hammers because in total, in absolute numbers, it's too low. But actually, if you are an SNOP manager or leader, what you really want is your team to focus the time on the most important product. In this example, that wouldn't be the nails. How do we solve this? Actually, it's quite simple. 
we can simply express forecast demand and L in value, so in dollar, in euro, or whatever. So as you can see here, I basically included the fact that one nail is worth a few cents and a hammer is, for, is worth a few euro. So right away, you see that now what's driving the L and the absolute L are these hammers. So if I'm a demand planner and I want to improve the overall accuracy expressed in value, I don't need to work on the nails. I need to work on the hammers. Now, you really have to see this concept here of value-weighted metrics in combination with forecast value added. The two together allow you as a manager, as a leader, to ensure that your team is adding value, but they're also adding value to the right product. So you're basically absolutely certain that your team delivers and they create real value for your supply chain. Uh, I think that's it for me, and we can go to a first case study. So I will give the floor to uh, my colleague Jamal. Let me stop sharing my screen so he can start uh, doing it. Uh, Jamal, are you able to share your screen? Yes, one second, let me. Uh... Perfect, and I can hear you properly, so that's great. In the meantime, we have 300 people joining us. That's so great, thank you. Um, you can also use the chat to ask questions. We're going to answer the question at the end of the webinar. We try to answer as many questions as we can, so don't hesitate to uh, type your question. Well, I make sure I have the, the last version. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to be here. I think I saw a question that is interesting at which level uh, of granularity we should forecast. So I know, if you want to take the the, the, the question right now, but usually what I would say is at the level of granularity that you need to make your decisions. Maybe you want to comment on this. Yeah, sure. I'll do that while you download the slide. So um, I let me let me reshare the slide as, as you, you do that. I'll just do this a second so I can really illustrate this point because I think it's an important one. And that's that's a, such a common error. Um, so the case I often see is you have supply chain forecasting it just because that's how they've been doing it for years, demand per market per month. But if you think about it from a supply chain point of view, you have a few warehouses and you have daily or weekly replenishment. So you need to have daily or weekly forecast to know what to put in these uh, orders. So it's very important when you do, when you work on your forecasting process to make sure that you basically size it to your supply chain. If you have a weekly supply chain, you need to have weekly forecast. If you have a supply chain with multiple warehouses per country, it might make sense to forecast demand uh, below the country level. Okay, so the way I like to summarize this is you should forecast demand at a granularity level that's matching the requirement from your supply chain. It's matching the decision that your supply chain need to make. And this is critical because otherwise, it's a bit like you're doing a lot of forecasting, you're tracking accuracy and stuff like that, but it has little value for your supply chain because you're not forecasting the right granularity. In the meantime, Jamal, do you have the presentation? Perfect, the floor is yours. Thank you again. So a bit of introduction of, of um, Sanofi as a whole. So we are a pharma, manuf bio pharma manufacturing company. Uh, we have four main GPUs, from vaccines to consumer healthcare. And uh, I have to understand that because we are manufacturing and because we uh, serve the products that we that we manufacture, we have not one supply chain like most of you, you know, we have, like most of you, many supply chains. And the different supply chains are quite complex to uh, mingle around. What is important also um, for us, and you will see that it, it connects with the forecast value added, is that we have a complex network, but mostly we have very long lead times. And in some products, the lead times can go up to two, three, four years. And for this reason, we need to forecast at short, medium, and very long term. This drives the supply chain decision as a function, so manufacturing, uh, procurement, etc. But it also, also drives on the, on the long term, the investment decision on where we should build a new factory where how we should upgrade some some lines so what we do is that we produce from uh, the global invention center here in barcelona forecast for all our products in all the markets on the monthly uh, monthly time buckets at scale and for um, at least uh, 36 to 60 month horizon 
Now, if we look at the demand planning process as a whole, um, we start with generating a quantitative baseline here in Barcelona. This is then uh, feeded to Kinaxis, that's the APS that we use. So basically, we get the data from Kinaxis, we use R, Python, a couple of, uh, but we do our own, own, own um, forecasting, um, cleansing models, etc. We push that back to Kinaxis so that it's spread uh, to the network. And before this flows to the network, you have the judgmental adjustment, as we call them in academia, that we call internally enrichment. So um, any market locally can say, no, I will sell a bit more, a bit less on this lag or on this other uh, time horizon. The um, measure that uh, we talk about today is the difference between, so we measure here the forecast value added between step one and step two. And uh, I don't enter into detail, but yes, we also measure the forecast value added before uh, step one versus as you said, uh, Van de Poot, it's a very good practice versus a benchmark. And sometimes, you know, as humans generating forecasts, we also have our own biases. Sometimes you'll pick not the best, uh, the best forecast will be, you pick the second best for any reason. And then you, we measure also if we have been efficient in our own selection of the best model. But let's look at the forecast value added. And um, I think what is important here is the concept is quite clear. And you'll, you'll see that it's quite important to look at different uh, slices and dices. So what you see here, I first, I first get a bit the, the markets, but what you see is the volume on the left. In, in the middle, you see, so here we have a weighted map where the weight is on the volume, have different criteria, but we use this one here. And what you see is that if you look at market by market, so we look at different countries, the country A that is on top is doing quite a good job on improving on top of the baseline. So positive forecast value added, which is great. We have the example of the country Z on the bottom that is not doing a good job overall on the portfolio. And then you have the gray one. So not good, not bad. Uh, sometimes it's also a reflection to have on um, doing very small adjustment. Does it really uh, bring value in terms of time well spent? But then you have to open up and deep dive a bit more. In this case, we enter into the details of those countries and then we uh, plot separately what are the improving um, enrichments and wha what are the worsening enrichments. So country A is still doing very good, country Z is still doing bad. But in the middle, you see that the country M that seemed to be quite uh, neutral actually has a lot of uh, positive adjustment and a lot of negative adjustment. It helped us enter into detail and look at what is happening specifically in this, in this country. Actually, it is very driven by tenders. So then we have another plan of action that is mostly focused on uh, the prediction of the tenders and the time of the orders coming from the tenders. Again, important to slice and dice, uh, slice and dice, sorry. And you have many ways to look at it. Here, what we do is that we look at individual SKUs for a specific country. And we show to this country, look, on all those SKUs on the right, you see that your forecast value added actually is negative. So maybe you shouldn't spend time here. Uh, but in the meantime, there are a lot of products where they are doing a good job. So you should continue there. It also helps us in the feedback loop because when a market is giving a better performance than the statistical uh, or the quantitative baseline that we give, then it gives us a, a bit more challenge so that we can improve the models and try to beat again the market. So overall, the forecast value added is one piece that helps you uh, have a positive feedback loop. You can slice and dice differently. And in this case, we are looking at different forecast horizons. So we look at different lags and it drives interesting discussions. So in this specific case, um, what we are looking at is that on dark, you see the, the quantitative baseline and in purple, the final baseline. So the final forecast that has already the quantitative plus the judgmental adjustment. You see that on the short midterm, so let's say up to like maybe nine, 10, they are quite, um, the quantitative one is quite better. So the, the enrichments or the adjustments are deteriorating or worsening the performance. But on the mid long term, you see that it's the contrary. So the, the quantitative models that we use are better on the short midterm, but not on the mid long term. So on one hand, it helps us also think of how we can combine short, mid, long term, long range uh, algorithms. But on the other hand, it's, it also helps on the discussion when you have to convince your marketing, your commercial finance team to say, look, if you look at the short midterm, 
um, you maybe you don't need to enrich or you need to add your agents but, but usually on the mid long term you're quite good so you you are trade bringing some value having some good market insight that are helping us on the mid long term maybe you should speak like this let us do the short term continue doing the the mid long term so the discussions are not on mine is better than yours but where mine is better let's use mine when your uh, judgmental adjustment are good let's use them so we have the best of both worlds another split and it will be the last one is that you can also uh, look separately this is actually what has been done in the different papers about forecast value added you look uh, separately on the value added of the positive adjustments so i'm adding on top of the quantitative baseline and the negative adjustments i'm removing or uh, um, putting pushing down um, the quantitative baseline in specific case what we see is that um, overall the negative enrichment seems to be quite good so the um, the purple the purple ones that are uh, uh, clear and then the dark ones that are in the bottom you see that the positive enrichment from so adding on top of whatever quantitative baseline are received are uh, worsening the baseline so then you can have discussions around what is the driver of putting more uh, on top of uh, the baseline you you related a bit to it and nicola and uh, the same on the other side so usually when someone in let's say in the business close to the business um, really changes the baseline to be much lower they what we understand in this reading is that they have clear information so that they can expose themselves say that they will not maybe hit the target because there is a true event that's impacting uh, the demand and maybe a couple of takeaways so again when you sit in a um, supply chain you help drive the decision on manufacturing procurement and those are not the decisions that your colleagues whatever they sit in the company may want to have so each forecast is helping you decide in uh, an unclear future uh, what are the helping you take the correct decision so don't forget the why and the purpose initial purpose of your forecast so that you compare apples to apples um workload reduction is easier to talk about with people than forecast performance when they are out of your department uh, slicing and dicing is very important so that you focus on um, like i said it can be time horizon it can be specific products it can be specific countries whatever hierarchy you have um and again feeding back your feeding back your your modeling with the, the positive enrichment because there is something there that you could potentially uh, use in in your in your pipeline and uh, in this specific case we're talking about point forecast and um judgment with a judgmental adjustment post quantitative depending on, on on your your own world and your own reality uh, feel free to adapt any question maybe or maybe at the end yeah we will take the the question at the end uh, because I, I i'm sure there will be a lot of questions so uh thank you so much uh jamal so again for Everyone listening, you have a Q&R, you can ask your question there. It's going to be easier for us to see all the questions there than in the conversation. So if you have any question, please feel free to put that in the Q&R. And then once the uh, discussion from Curtis and uh, I mean Curtis and Stefan will do the presentation, we can then review a few of the, the questions. This being said, Curtis, the floor is yours. Ready to go. Thank you very much, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. Looking forward to sharing a little bit about Rich Products and our journey implementing the FBA process. For those who don't know, Rich Products is a global food manufacturing company based in Buffalo, New York. Um, we've privately owned, have been around for um, you know good amount of time. We do operate primarily in the U.S., but have a global presence in areas such as South America, South Africa, Europe, the Middle East, um, Asia. And really our product offering is very wide, both across the, the types of products that we offer, um, everything from pizza to desserts to consumer packaged goods, um, to a wide variety of customers. Um, customers that are your traditional grocery stores to customers that are more like a restaurant. Um, so we have very different types of products that follow different seasonalities, obviously. Different types of customers that might use those same products differently. Going back several years, um, 
prior to our implementation of the FBA process, we really were very much in a place of a high manual process. We have approximately 125,000 forecast combinations, which at the time was the product shipping point level. Um, and really no means that we were generating that true baseline or automated statistical forecast. Um, on top of that, we still were performing collaboration processes with the sales team, with marketing team, getting input from our supply chain. And we didn't really have a good means or really any means of being able to differentiate where a final forecast came from. Was it from something that my demand planning team did, or was it something that we received from the sales team, or was it something that we received from marketing? And what that really led to was a lot of unclear ownership um, and accountability for the forecast. So when there were errors, you know, how did we understand how to drive into and correct the actions? Looking forward to today, um, around Q4 of 2021, we went through a rather large implementation of Blue Yonder software, um, the Demand 360 and Luminate Demand Edge module, which allows us to start off by first having that baseline forecast at a customer level. And what that really opened up for us, along with some configuration decisions on how to be able to track input and maintain forecast by the system output versus the sales team versus the demand team, was really drive that accountability back into the correct individuals and create a forecast that both served our supply chain and was able to be leveraged and used and collaborated upon with the business effectively. Using all the data that was generated from the system and from the collaboration process, we developed an in-house application that really allowed us to put this process in place, to have the metrics for forecast value add, to have analytics to be able to look at those different levels that we just called out a second ago by the product portfolio or by the customer portfolio, and really establish a solid automated governance process so that the different teams were able to have an accountability discussion as to what they did to the final forecast and where we needed to correct going forward. The key I would say to all of this, going from the before to the after, is really the use of the data to tell the story and to show the value. We needed to have those discussions both with our supply chain leadership to be able to say, look, we're putting this in front of a sales leader. They're probably not going to like what we're saying their team is doing to that final number, but you know, this is what the data is showing and this is how they're impacting it. And then similarly, bringing that same discussion to the sales leadership teams to help them to understand what the end benefit and the impact was going to be from having these discussions and getting that forecast more and more accurate. Reductions in inventory, better asset and capacity utilization, just improved overall cost structure and better service to their customers. So looking at the benefits, and there definitely have been benefits that we've seen, um, we really more kind of formally stood this up several months ago, and it really was around Q1 that we kind of formally got ourselves lined up to be able to execute this. Over the past several months, we have seen absolutely drastic reductions in our bias, um, and we track our bias both at a two month out and a one month out lag to tie to different supply chain activities um, by the production lead time or by the deployment lead time into our network. And really this was driven from a few things. First, the high levels of automation that we've been able to derive from the system where it is working very effectively on our stable products. We're at about a 50% touchless forecast, which means that baseline system output is used without any modifications. That being said, there's always work that needs to happen to maintain the model from a parameter setting, um, but the actual number generation is system generated. Secondary, what we've done through those conversations and alignment on governance with the leadership teams is really had a reduction in the amount of overrides that are coming into the process. The sales team needs to have the data to come in and bring to the discussion to have an override go into effect. The demand planning team is empowered to really push back on that and to say, look, um, I hear what you're saying. We can by all means put it in and track it and capture it, but the data may or may not be there to support this decision. So let's work it in to capture what the output would be but let's stay with our baseline numbers for now. And between those two things, the team has really been able to focus on higher um, variability items or new products, which we all know is a very difficult thing to manage as a demand planner. Collaboration with both our internal clients and our external customers, and really helping to drive those discussions around the assumptions and to develop very robust assumptions, as well as look at the external factors that are going on within the network and within the business. Just to give a line of sight to what that in-house application looks like, and there's a lot more to this, but we just wanted to pull out a few of the, the more fun pages. 
The first view that we have here is really a view to help and assist the team in having the exceptions of where the system is performing the best versus where maybe their number is the best as a demand planner, my base number is the best, or the consensus process is netting a good result and give a very clear and easy way of being able to see where I should maybe switch the input that I'm using for my final process. Um, if we look at that first row, for example, the LDE or the system generated output did net the best. If we look lower down, we've got some where the consensus process and that collaboration with stakeholders did drive good value and benefit. The last view I've leave with is one that I'm particularly fond of, which really provides an overall feedback analysis or feedback loop to individuals as updates are made. So the data and the way we structured it, we really allowed ourselves to be able to say, show me the spots where I am just using what the sales team gave me or just using what a customer directly gave me or what my demand planners did. And we can pull out that subset of the data and say, versus what the system started you at, where do you end? And this in its own right has been huge because if you wanna talk about driving accountability and driving changes in behavior, being able to talk to an individual salesperson for their specific customers and say, look, last time we talked, we decided to do this override to the system. We ended up increasing our overall number by 100,000, and we ended up coming in light to that by 80,000. Well, maybe next time we need to put a little more vetting behind this and we need to look at why we put in that 100 and what was wrong with it and what we need to adjust going forward. Overall, the forecast value add framework and process has been incredibly valuable to Riches. Um, it's been incredibly well bought in by the sales and divisional leadership teams as they've understood and seen the value proposition. And we're very glad to have had the opportunity to put it in place and uh, happy to answer any questions when we get to the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kirti. So, uh, Stefan, now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, allowed to, to share my screen. Maybe you check it in the right. Check this right away. Um, hmm. Let me check again. Sorry for that. I think you should be able to do it now. Yes, can see it now. Perfect. Let me share um, PowerPoint. Okay. Oops. Okay. So in practice, well, so thank you for for the opportunity to to show you uh, skew science and how we we deal with forecast value added. So just a few words uh, about me before I start. So I'm running uh, skew science, a uh, company that we founded in 2018. I'm certified in planning and inventory management. I co founded three software startups, and I also work in large companies like uh, Intel, Motorola, and Aero Electronics. Uh, and you can reach me at this uh, email address if you wish. And just to explain, I mean, uh, why we, we created Skew Science. So when we created the company in 2018, the idea was to, to support the best practices advocated by, by Nicolas and to propose a super easy uh, to use platform. And uh, basically, uh, the idea is that you can use this platform without even talking to a salesperson. So you can try it for free. Uh, again, you can create an account in 10 seconds. We don't force you to, to go with any templates to, to try out with your own data to, to create a forecast. So we have a wizard to, to do that. And so based, based on your demand history, we will generate the forecast. We can archive them in order to track all the KPIs and also the forecast value added. And you get your dashboard and reports of the shelves. So you can get results normally in minutes to see whether or not you, you like it and, and to adopt it. Okay. So now let me switch to the tool because I think that the, the main ID here. So you should see my screen normally. Okay, so basically uh, what you can see on the left, we, we have several tools and I'm going to show you, uh, a, let's say, 10 items. And as you can see, my, my items are organized, I mean, also per location. So it can be stored in warehouses or it can be related to any factory. And if I go to the first item in the list, basically what we loaded in the tool is uh, some historical demand data, okay, in the plain blue line. And the tool automatically pick, uh, I mean, a forecast, a baseline forecast that you can see uh, 
also in this table. Okay, so this is uh, the data generated by the tool. And as a user, I mean, you have the ability to, to change the data and adjust the data based on your market expertise. And this is the data that you can see below in the forecast adjustments. Okay. Uh, what you can see as well is that this is not the only forecast that we have in the system. So we have archived all the previous forecasts from the users. Okay. Most the baseline from the tool and from the, all the adjustments from, from a particular user. And if, for example, we, we see, you know, this, uh, this period of July, okay? So the actual is, is uh, 670, now we have this data. We can compare against the baseline, which is uh, 582 for this particular forecast. And the user, you know, uh, uh, captured uh, 524, okay? So you can see by, if I switch to a different forecast that the baseline is, is changing because every cycle, I mean, the, the tool has updated the, uh, the forecast and picked uh, different models, but the user kept the, the always the same the same information. Okay, so now that we have all these archives uh, considering the the baseline as well as the adjustments, if we switch to the KPI tool, uh, we have the choice to analyze different uh, KPIs. So we can select the error or the bias. So it's up to the user to to decide. And then the, the idea is not to explain really what the lag is about, but uh, I think you've seen that already in some presentation from Nicolas. But let's say if you want to analyze uh, the actuals against the forecast that was made one month earlier, so we'll select lag one. And so the tool will automatically compute and analyze the error uh, for this particular delay between the actuals and the forecast. Okay, so you, what you can see here, for example, if we pick July 2023, you can see that the tool uh, was 53 units above the, the actuals. The user actually was 13 units uh, actually above. And if you look at the, the value added, you see that the value added is, is, I mean, the, it has decreased, the user has decreased uh, the number of units by 40 units. So it's a, it's a green cell because basically it's a positive impact. So if you look at the total, you can see the total line considering all the items, you see it's, uh, it's red, which means that basically uh, overall, all the change, we are not uh, adding any value for the, the full, if you consider the full uh, number of items, okay? So not only you can see this uh, in units, as Nicolas mentioned, you can also see it if you prefer to focus on the on the revenue and what is the cost of the error in terms of revenue. So we can ask the, to recompute this data automatically, and the tool re will recompute this data and you can see in euros what is the cost of the forecast value added, okay? And you can see also at the bottom what is the impact, okay? So this, you can see this at the item level, uh, warehouse level, let's say, and you also have the ability, if you wish, uh, because if you want to analyze per country or for, for any factory, you can ask to get the same information computed by, uh, I would say, uh, at an aggregate level. So here I'm focusing on the location. So the tool is actually for every uh, region is compiling this data and you can see the forecast value added again in dollar here uh, for any particular period and you can see whether or not from one cycle to another one you are improving or decreasing the, the value added and in this particular case you can see that from june to may uh, to june to july basically uh, it's even worse than before for for paris okay so this is basically how you can get this type of information directly into a i would say a platform uh, and you see just by changing a few drop-down menu and, and asking to recompute the data. You can access directly this uh, information that is really uh, super important for to take any take decision regarding your supply chain. Okay, I think I, I, I'm I'm done with the presentation. The five minutes Perfect. That given to me. Thank so, you, thank you. thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for a concrete example on how that would work with the tool. Uh, we received so many questions in the Q and R. Thank you so much for that. I already quickly replied to a few of them, which are more technical. Now, I would like to give the floor to Curtis and Jamal to, to answer a few questions that I think are extremely important and relevant. The first one is from Daniel Barrett. I will just read it myself. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your question. Let me read that out loud. So Daniel is saying, I believe in forecast value added as a learning method for demand planners, but there are any concrete example in the case studies of how forecast value added has been successfully used as a way to change leadership behavior in the consensus DP process. Maybe Curtis and then Jamal, would you mind giving your experience with this? So how do you convince leadership to act or leadership to change the way they, they work with forecast? Yeah, uh, so 
one of the things that we did is we really came to the leadership with several months of output and data and said to them, hey, based on the input that we're receiving from your sales team on new product launches or on new customer launches, we're driving this much incremental inventory, this much incremental cost into the supply chain network. And also, you know, we've had to make production rationalization decisions that have prevented us from servicing other portions of your business. So what we've really done is, is use the forecast value add to say, these are the spots where we're getting the impact and getting a very negative impact. That's not just from an accuracy standpoint, it's impacting the supply chain and impacting your service to your customers. And that alone kind of cuts them loose to their sales team so that they can help correct and drive the proper behavior, proper vetting and proper use of data in future forecast generations and collaboration. I don't know if I can add more on top of you, Cortis. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, maybe if I ha if I ha can comment something else, um, really the the I think the behavior started to change, and we saw some start of people changing understanding when we talked more about workload and you know doing less things but doing them well, than and fo refocusing where we need to focus than talking about, you know, points of uh, improvement in a KPI. So it was mostly on, okay, we have scarce resources, uh, we have to put them at work where they really bring value. And just let, you know, models and math help where, where they can. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for the answer. There is another, I think, very, very interesting question from uh, Diaz Geronimo. I, I would just read the, the, the second part again. Diaz Geronimo, thank you so much for it. So he is asking, are your sales uh, people or the local market accepting a pushback from demand planning if they do an override that the demand planners do not like? How does, does it go in terms of relationship between the sales people, demand planning and, and this kind of pushback? Maybe this time we could start with Jamel. How, how is it going on your side? It, de it depends a lot. It depends a lot on, on uh, which country I'm talking about and which. Uh, so I don't have a clear answer because it depends a lot on of, again the country, the what kind of products, and we have to understand that uh, we produce medicines and uh, we have a very risk averse um, uh, industry, and sometimes we we are let's say we agree to have another stock to have a risk of destruction just to make sure that there is no probability of, of not serving a patient. So, specific uh, case, again, fit to your need. From my perspective, a lot of it is about that relationship that exists between my demand planning team and the individual sales owner. Um, so, they're always in the process of making sure that they're an established partner of the business. Um, and when they do have pushback, it's really about helping them to understand you know, first the impacts of the override and what it could cause or would cause. And second, helping them to better understand the supply chain and how it's set up to account for variability. Um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about what a forecast is used for. Is it used to just generate the inventory? Well, no, it's used to plan production, to plan safety stock. Um, and, and that educational piece, I think, is huge to bring into these discussions, um, as well as the data to just support, you know, here's what would happen if X or Y. If, if I may just com complete, yeah. Nicolas, because I, I'm reading now the question, there is a part that maybe we don't tackle it um, about what the, f the software, the process, etc. But I'm, I was thinking about uh, something also that, that makes a difference is um, when you show point forecast then um, and you don't show uh, what is the room, whatever, true quantile, or quantile or probabilistic or, or whatever technique, um, you don't show what are the, the range of possibilities. Um, then the discussion is harder than when you can show the range of possibilities and you can let people have a, a bit of wiggle room where it makes sense if they want to change, they know that they are inside a bandwidth that, or a range that can make sense. Perfect. Thank you, Jean. I'm, I'm using that to um, take the, the, the third and I guess for today the last question. I, 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 I see a lot of technical questions. I will try to answer that in, in a short email after the webinar, so I, I will try to give as much insight as I can. There is here a question that I think is very interesting from Olive, and I will I will just try to, to, to summarize it. How do you convince people, demand planners, sales people, or even leadership to start using a statistical engine? Right? Because for a lot of supply chain, today they might have a process that is very, I would say, human, manual driven, where 
planners or sales make a forecast and then one day you start implementing a software whatever the software is and you say to people look now the baseline is this software you should start using it and i know that a lot of supply chain this kind of change management this change does not happen it's kind of difficult now i would love to hear the three of you discussing that and i see that curtis and Jamal are already moving but maybe just to give maybe to stefan a few minutes how does it go with your experience with the different teams that you have coached to, to use the tool? How do you go from this, it's very manual, it's very human driven to people have to let it go and just trust the tool, at least for some part? I think the, um, we have some customers online I think, commenting in, in, the, in the discussion, but basically I think the, the idea for us is that people can really automate their process, right, and get the baseline. So what we've seen from experience, people do not al always uh, embrace KPIs uh, upfront, you know, because uh, most of the time, I think the, the team in particular, they want to, to, to get a better accuracy regarding the forecast and they don't have the, the, the expertise to create a, uh, a good baseline forecast. So at least they benefit from the tool to get a, a clear improvement uh, regarding that matters. But uh, then regarding the, the KPI tracking, I think that people need to be more educated. And I think the type of webinar we are running today, especially for small and medium business, is are really key because people, you know, they very often the solution. And I think the two the two solutions you, you both are using are kind of expensive and maybe a medium-sized business cannot afford to go through, uh, through blue, blue yonder, you know, even if they, they provide maybe good tools. Huh? But clearly there is the implementation time, the cost of the project is uh, is too is too big for this for these guys. And so this is where we, we, we probably have an offer and we see people small we have small companies as well as larger ones are using the same platform but basically yeah as i said uh, i think kpis you don't embrace them right up front i mean it's after uh, several months becoming familiar with uh, with improving the i would say the process itself you know asking the right question with uh, with uh, not only the supply chain flows that are driving the project usually but they need to interact with the sales team and this is when they, they start you know moving forward in uh, in uh, I, I mean increasing the accuracy of the forecast Great. Now, Jamal, I know that you've been yourself on a journey with your team to move from exactly. this very human manual to this automation. Yeah. Yes. So just just before uh, just before reacting a bit, uh, uh, Stefan, I totally agree with what you said. Um, I also want to point out that 90% uh, of what we 95% of what we use is actually open source, so it's cheap, and then we feed back Kinexis. But uh, so Kinexis is more uh, repo. For the, but anyway, having the team to build everything you build is not cheap and not accessible maybe for SMBs. Um, it's a hard topic and again, each one has can have its own approach. We, in our experience, we stick a lot of time with, um, depending again on the maturity of the country and the, the people we have in front of us, Sometimes we stick maybe longer than we could uh, with very basic statistical models, ARIMA, elastic net, uh, some multiple linear regressions, because they were explainable. So it was easier for us to say, look, those are the variables. This is not a black box. That's why I'm taking into account. That's why it's giving you. So first, not a black box. Second, bringing the performance. And then we, we could have the discussions of, uh, I, I could try something else. It seemed to give you more value, but you know, we're entering to the machine learning world and, and then it will be a bit less explainable. Is it fine? Okay, we can test. So depending again on the industry, and I remind that we are very risk averse, we, we went step by step from something that is very explainable and simple to present to something that is a bit more elaborate. Thank you, Jamel. And then finally, uh, Curtis, how, how did you do this transition from, because reading your slide, it looks like in 2020, early 2021, it was very, very manual. And then you went through very high automation. So I guess for a lot of people here, this is a very interesting journey. Yeah, I think there was really kind of a, a twofold approach. First is proving out the, the benefits to the metric, the accuracy and the bias. And then the second is building the confidence in the stability of the output. Um, the model that we use right now actually runs every single week. So that means every single week you have a new number. Um, so really what we look to do is we did both, you know, micro and macro, you know, very specific single product code testing, and then our whole business on a regression basis. So we said, okay, if I look at what the inputs would have been six months ago, what would it have given me for the last six months? 
seven, five months ago, last five months, four months ago, last four months, and so on. And we really use that to help build the confidence in the tool and confidence in the system output. What that also allowed us to do is to see how much variation there is in the output on a cycle over cycle basis. So between those two things, we really developed you know, sets of tools and in the application tool sets to kind of track those two aspects and say, where is the model doing well? Where is it outperforming what we would expect it to be? Or where is it outperforming your override? And it's stable. If those two things are met, why as a demand planner would you not want to use it? Especially if we have proven out that it is better and it is stable and that it means you don't have to do it and you can focus on something else. Um, so we really tried to drive it in by first building confidence in the system and then helping to create a culture that is okay with a bit of risk. Thank you, Curtis. If I may just conclude on this one, for me, forecast evaluated, it's really the tool that you would need in general supply chain businesses to prove over time how good or bad in some cases, unfortunately, the, the, the baseline forecast is doing. And you have numbers. So it's not just about your opinion or your feeling that you feel like people should use it. It's more like, look, month after month, this is the accuracy that we automatically got out of this software. And this is the accuracy made by the sales team of the demand planning team. So you really have data to show the value of the tool. And then also, I think it's it's a question of collaboration. It's not saying, well, this is the software versus sales versus planners. No, it's one team. The way I like to put it is teams should let the software do most of the work, 50, 80, 90, 95% of the work. And then they should enrich it when they have insights, information, data that the model is not aware of. I'll just take a very simple example. Let's imagine you have a software that cannot cope with promotion, like the model is not aware of that and you know that you're going to run a promotion for a product tomorrow, this is a great time to go there and enrich your forecast. It's very likely you're going to add value. Now, if you have a model that is aware of promotion, you also know there's a promotion tomorrow, no need to change it because the model should do it, right? So for me, it's a very collaborative approach where the software is doing most of the work and planner and sales team and, and, and leadership will enrich it when you are aware of things that the tool is not aware. Now, everyone, that was a very insightful one hour. Jamal, Curtis, Stefan, thank you so much for your help. Thank you so much for the content. I'm sure that the people here learned a lot from you. I think it's inspiring for many of them to see that this is the road. People did it so they can do it as well. We had up to 350 people connected at the same time today. This is a work record for me. That was really great. Thank you, everyone. I think you can all like uh, applaud yourself in the chat room and say, uh, thank you to each other. Thank you so much for your question. I will do my best to answer them after the webinar and uh, possibly try to share uh, the slides and the video. So everyone, wherever you are, have a great day, great evening. Ciao.